Hey everybody, I'm Rock Spectre Comics and I'm back. With the Moon Knight series just coming out, I figured I'm going to do episode breakdowns, hopefully for all six episodes of the series. That's my intention at least. And uh, if you're interested in that, getting some of my breakdowns, my thoughts, what may be coming next, stay tuned for that intro. So welcome back. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell notification so that when I do put out some content, you get in a timely fashion. So I'm going to be doing the episode breakdowns for Moon Knight series, hopefully all six if I get a chance. And uh, we're going to start with episode one. There's going to be a lot of questions um, because a lot of people are not too familiar with the Moon Knight series. Uh, they haven't read a lot of Moon Knight books in the past and... It was a lot thrown at us in episode one. I thought the episode was fantastic. Great cinematography. Um, the direction of it is very interesting. I like how they focused a lot on Stephen Grant in the first episode. But um, you see a lot of parts where it's like you're looking at it and you just have no idea what's going on. So this is why I'm going to do the breakdown. Um, There's going to be, like I said, some spoilers. I did find some spoilers online. Um, via Twitter of the first four episodes, the duration of it. So, uh, and it looks pretty reliable source. Episode one was right around 45 minutes. Looks like episode two and three is going to be 50 minutes and episode four, 51 minutes, you know, give or take, you know, a few seconds here and there. And, uh, with about five minutes of end credits. So that's about right. The first episode was right around 40 minutes of actual screen time. So, um, Interesting that they would release the first four and not all six, but so be it. Uh, so you see that opening scene with Dr. Arthur Harrow, and um, he does his daily, you know, ritual where he puts a glass, fills it up with water, puts his finger around the actual rim of the glass, proceeds to drink it, then he covers the glass, smashes it with his crocodile staff, and then uses those shards and places them in his shoes and then walks away. Pretty interesting opening scene. Um, but like if you're not familiar with Harrow in the comics, he actually was selected for his, his work in medicine. He got a Nobel Prize in the field of pain therapy. Um, it wasn't until Dr. Her, you know, his partner, Dr. Victoria Grail, became a little suspicious and started doing some investigation and in fact found some papers that you know not only carried out research on animals but goes all the way back to you know scientists in Auschwitz that led back to Dr. Arthur Harrow he was actually experimenting on humans as well he in the comics is a brilliant surgeon and and you know ends up obviously going in a different path <laughs> to say the least but um he actually suffers, one of his weaknesses, he suffers from dry, a trigeminal neuralgia, so, uh, which paralyzes his left face and the uh, left side of his mouth. That's why you see in the comics his face is kind of like just smushed up on the left. And uh, it leads him to like a permanent snarl and causes him in constant pain. So you see him throughout this, the actual episode, he, he looks like he's, you know, wobbling a little bit, limping, and it's because he's suffering from that. And... Um, kind of a cue of him putting the glasses in his feet, the shards is a kind of test his pain. So that's one of his weaknesses that he's trying to work with. So fun little opening scene that actually goes back to the comics. And we get to the uh, opening scene with Stephen Grant and uh, they start playing this 60s song, A Man Without Love by uh, Engelbert Humperdinck and um, it starts to sing, every day I wake up, then I start to break up, lonely is a man without love. Which is pretty funny because every day Stephen Grant wakes up, has no idea what happened the night before, can't remember any of his memories, and uh, he's just a lonely man. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it just, you know, it goes on every day, I start out, then I cry my heart out, lonely is a man without love. So I, I thought it was a pretty 
pretty fitting song for the opening scene. And uh, they show, obviously, the Marvel Studios um, uh, like logo. I'm hoping they do something a little to change the colors up a little bit for the uh, Moon Knight series going forward. But a uh, very interesting opening scene. You see him shackled with the locks on the bed. And uh, he, you know, obviously opens it up. He gets out of bed. And you see a little bit of sand parked in front of his bed. And I'm going to get right into the ancient Egyptian mythology right off the bat by saying that it could be ties to one of the Ennead uh, gods. And I'm specifically talking about the deity Set or Seth as often as um, talked about in the Ennead. And I'll get more into the Ennead in a little bit. And Seth is a god of deserts, storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners in ancient Egyptian religion. In ancient Greek, the god's name is given as Seth. Seth had a positive role where he accompanied Ra on his bark to repel Apep, the serpent of chaos. So I'm wondering if, you know, Mark Spector put the sand in front of that as a little bit of protection. So, um, but then he gets up, walks into the front of the door, he sees the tape in front of the door, peels it off, tosses it, and then he walks towards the fish tank. And I was like, oh, hey, hey, Gus, how are you doing today? So <laughs> he refers to uh, the goldfish as Gus, which is the name of the first title of episode one, The Goldfish Problem. So Gus is, uh, only has, you know, one, one uh, gill, I mean, one fin, sorry. And uh, he's feeding it, and then he starts talking to his mom, which you never hear his mom talk back. So, so then you later see Stephen Grant walking into the building, which is where he works, and in London at the uh, Natural Art and Science Museum, which ends up, you know, ironically having a display that month on the uh, ancient Egypt. So uh, he sees this girl who looks like sticking a piece of gum in the pyramid, and he starts talking to her about uh, ancient Egypt, and he's, Stephen Grant's actually quite knowledgeable in it, and he talks about, well, all the cool stuff is over here, so he brings her over, and he shows her one of the um, sarcophagus, and he starts talking, well, after you die, they get a big hook, and they pull out all your organs, except for your heart, and the heart was very important, because of the underworld and what they would do is Anubis would weigh the heart of a person against the feather of Mott, the goddess of truth, which was depicted as an ostrich feather, you know, the feather that was often pictured in, in Mott's headdress. If the heart was judged to not be pure, Amit, which we'll get more into Amit later, would devour it and the person undergoing judgment was not allowed to continue their voyage towards Osiris and immortality, in which Stephen Grant talks about the field of reeds. So that was very important. And we'll pay attention a little bit more into that. So like I said, we're now introducing more ancient Egyptian deities. Sweet. So uh, he starts getting all the uh, pieces of inventory to sell at the shop, and he starts talking about the, the Ennead, and uh, this is our first introduction to what I was talking about with the Ennead. And the Ennead is very important in uh, the Moon Knight series. So um, he talks about on the banner, there's only seven deities on the banner, and there should be nine. So that was like a, you know, a big mistake. And we'll, we'll talk more about the Ennead in a little bit. He was like, oh, you got Horus, Osiris, Tefna. And she says, stop, please. <laughs> but uh, those, those are going to be, you know, very important, you know, going into the series. And um, especially uh, when we're talking about Horus and Osiris and Isis. I talked a little bit about this back in last summer's um, spec books to look out for. I believe this was Thor issue 239. And uh, that was a pretty important book to pick up because it talks about Heliopolis, you know, which 
is where the group of nine deities in Egyptian mythology worshipped. You know, the sun god Atum, his children Shu and Tefna, their children Geb and Nut, and their children Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. So the Ennead also sometimes includes the son of Osiris and Isis, Horus. Which, there you go. You see it's done all pieced together. Those are the important nine deities in, in, in Heliopolis. So um, if you haven't picked up Thor issue 239, probably a good time to pick up that issue. Additionally, Thor issue number 240, which is also the first appearance of Seth. So another book, they, they go together. 239 and 240 are very important to the uh, ancient Egyptian mythology. So then it gets real interesting. He goes back home, starts getting ready for his ritual for sleep. Similar to uh, how the ritual we saw in the opening scene with Dr. Arthur Harrow. Stephen Grant has a similar ritual where every night he lays out the sand in front of the bed, gets the tape ready in front of the door, and he starts listening to an audio tape on how to get through the night. You know, so uh, he starts working on the Rubik's Cube. Then he starts reading books, and surprisingly enough, he reads about the Ennead, which is your going back to your Easter egg, what I talked about before. And, and I'll probably just do um, a separate video talking about the, the, the nine deities and how important they are. Because uh, there's a lot of information pertaining to the, um, the nine deities and, and, and the series in, in general. So uh, I'll likely do a separate video on that. And then he falls asleep and wakes up and he's in the Swiss Alps. <laughs> his face is busted up. He puts his jaw back into place. And then he hears a voice. And uh, lo and behold, it's Khonshu. And he's, <laughs> he's saying, oh no, the worm. The worm's back. And they start talking to him, and he's saying, oh, surrender the body. And he's like, what body? Oh, the idiot's in control. And it, the voice is hilarious. It almost reminds me of the voice of uh, Venom and uh, the symbiote. <laughs> so it's pretty funny hearing him exchange back and forth with him. So then he uh, starts walking, and then he senses his early presence. And you see Khonshu right behind him, and then he disappears. And then all of a sudden, you see he starts looking up into the tower, starts talking to the person, and it, they start firing back at him, and he starts running. <laughs> and uh, there's, you know, obviously some people chasing after uh, Mark Spector, and uh, Stephen Grant starts running back into the, the Swiss village. And then this is where we get introduced. You know, you see people walking into the village center when they hear the bells chime and uh, you get this very cult-like vibe and all these people are walking in and we get introduced into uh, Ethan Hawke's character Dr. Arthur Harrow. So then we get to the meeting of Stephen Grant and Harrow. We see the part where he starts speaking Egyptian and Stephen Grant's the only one who doesn't bow down quickly so he's like I know you, mercenary. Who, me? No. I'm Stephen Grant, gift shop this. <laughs> well, okay, Stephen Grant, gift shop this. If uh, you don't mind, just um, hand over the scarab. I say, yeah, 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 sure, no problem. And he goes about trying to give him the scarab, and then Kanshu starts talking to him. It's like, you will do no such thing. And as a, he's about to give him the scarab, Kanchu overtakes him in the power and closes his hand. And then Harrow's looking at him, all strange. And then they go to the part where they try to, he continues to give him the scarab and it just doesn't happen. <laughs> and he starts walking away and all of a sudden his body goes over into Mark Spector and he wakes up again as Stephen Grant. And you see his hands are all bloodied up and all the bad guys are on the ground. And I thought that was a pretty cool scene. It reminded me of that classic Moon Knight cover when he's dressed up in his suit and he has those big bloody knuckles. So that was, that was pretty cool. So then he proceeds to start walking away. He's like, don't you drop that scarab, you know, Kanchu. I was like, all right, all right, all right. 
and he, he steals this van and he, he drives off. And you get this great scene where they're driving down the Swiss Alps. And it, it was very reminiscent of when I went to Switzerland. And I know about those mountains. They're very windy. They're very treacherous. <laughs> so I thought that was great. Great cinematography. And he's driving away. And you see all the bad guys. And obviously, he, he's not a fighter. So then his body gives way. And then he's Mark Spector again. And uh, he wakes up back as Stephen Grant, and he has a gun in his hand. He has, oh, oh, freaks out, and then he tosses the gun <laughs> right in front of the car next to him. And the uh, car was like, oh, this idiot really threw a gun on, in front of the car. <laughs> so he uh, manages to get down to the bottom of the Alps, and then he puts his hands up, and then the uh, two bad guys are about to shoot him. And it just happens that the stumps from the trees roll down and the logs and uh, they they kill the two bad guys and i thought that was the uh, to be honest one of the bad parts cinematography wise uh of the of the actual episode you know i thought that was kind of you know cheesy cgi to see those fall down on the uh, on the bad guys and then the scene ends and he wakes up in his apartment so at this point now he's back in his apartment He's a hot mess. He's moping around, you know, eating a box of chocolates. And he drops the chocolates, and then he looks down. He sees some scratch marks on, on the wood floors. And then he gets pretty suspicious and starts looking around. He pulls up the rug. He sees nothing. And then he looks up. He sees a little crack there on part of the uh, boards on top of the apartment. And he grabs over the desk and climbs, and he pushes it open. And lo and behold, he finds a cell phone and a key. And uh, he opens up the cell phone. And there's like over 40 missed calls. And he starts looking through. It's missed call, missed call, missed call by Layla, Layla, Layla. And then he sees on call 32, Duchamp. So this was not done by accident by Marvel. They know what they're doing. So this was... Jean-Paul Duchamp, which if you're not familiar with the character, he's a French soldier um, that for a brief time was part of the French Foreign Legion and then later left the unit to become a soldier of fortune. And uh, the 32 on the missed call was ironic because if you know about this character, he first appeared in Werewolf by Night, issue number 32. So uh, <laughs> if you're looking for the character's first appearance, you're not going to get it now. <laughs> But anyways, um, while operating in North Africa, he ended up later on befriending a fellow mercenary, Mark Spector, which was uh, at that point enrolled in illegal fights. The two became close friends, and then Mark took to calling him Frenchy, obviously because he's French. Um, he operated as a pilot on the missions, and then Mark eventually found work alongside Raul Bushman. So I'll leave it at that for now. They'll be obviously going more into uh, Duchamp in later episodes, so I'm not going to get too in-depth with about the, uh, the character for the time being. So then Harrow starts talking about Amit and how if she would have been freed, the amount of people she would have saved from genocide. And he starts going about the, the wrath of Hitler, Nero, the Armenian Genocide, Pol Pot, all would have been prevented if she had been freed. And if not by the betrayal of indolent fellow gods and even her avatar. And it, Stephen was like, by avatar, what do you mean? Like anime? The blue people? <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny because uh, if you're not familiar, Disney now owns avatar and uh, they have an upcoming f sequel coming out later this year and then harrow starts to grab his arms and then he rolls up his sleeve and then he proceeds to uh judge him you know amit judges him and the scales go back and forth back and forth and it doesn't come to a decision is it because he's already died is it because he has, like he said, chaos in him. More to come on that. And then he runs away. And then we get this great scene where the museum gets dark. 
you start to see things running around and we get that big scene where you know you see Mark Spector beating up what looked like a werewolf you know there was a lot of speculation that maybe it's werewolf by night and now it ends up being uh, a jackal which is uh, pretty well known in ancient Egyptian mythology and uh, at that point he starts hearing voices when they close the door and he sees Mark talking to him. He's like, you got to let go. You got to let go so I, can, so I can fight. And he eventually lets go. And you see Mark Spector appear. He shows up in the suit finally. And uh, he beats the crap out of that jackal. And uh, that's the episode. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the breakdown as much as I did doing it. And... Uh, you know, we'll get some more breakdowns going forward. So uh, that's it for today. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, and until next time, Rock Spectre Comics, out.